Thanks for joining me here on Conversations for Yoga Teachers. I'm your host, Karen Fabian, the founder of Bare Bones Yoga. I'm an experienced registered yoga teacher with over 15 years of teaching experience, a certified personal trainer, and an entrepreneur. My mission is this, to help you develop into a purpose-driven, confident yoga teacher, one who truly understands anatomy and how to share it clearly and confidently so that you can help your students learn and as a result, grow your impact and connection. I strongly support and value the uniqueness of all individuals and provide a safe community where diversity is embraced. Through my mentorship and signature program called the Blueprint Learning Program, I help yoga teachers build their skills in the area of learning anatomy and along with that, help them learn important business skills and personal development ways of being that will transform them into purpose-driven teachers who make a big impact. On the podcast here, you'll get a blend of both anatomy learning, stories from teachers, interviews with others in the field, and a dose of personal development. For more information and to get on the wait list for any of my programs, see my website, barebonesyoga.com. everybody. Welcome to Conversations for Yoga Teachers. I am your host, Karen Fabian, the founder of Bare Bones Yoga. And I am recording this episode on Monday, February 22nd, 2021. And I couldn't be happier to be here today because I have a really special guest on the podcast today. It's someone that I'm going to kind of hold back on sharing uh, his story and how I connected with him, because it's just one of those things that, you know, just proves to me that if you're on uh, alert for good things to happen and good connections to be made, and you have a really clear sense of your purpose and your direction, you will find the right people to connect with. And I think when you listen to this episode, you're going to really just really just uh, get a kick out of, I mean, that's not even the best way to describe it, but you're really going, going to learn a lot from this episode. And I really hope that it hits home for you as much as it did for me. So I'm going to hold off on going into what today's episode is about and just give you a quick heads up about something I am hosting on Saturday before I get into introducing today's guest. So I want to start out by inviting you to a free workshop I'm doing, virtual of course, on Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern time all about how to give effective yoga cues. I'm going to share my own proprietary framework for yoga cueing, as well as my own proprietary format for how to decipher the cues you hear into their anatomy rationale. Now, of course, you know, we can never do that hundred percent until we actually ask the teacher who gave the cue, what were you thinking when you shared that cue or what was behind that? However, there are so many questions I get from yoga teachers that are around specific cues they hear and wanting to know the reason why for that cue that I created a system to help you break down cues you hear into their anatomical parts, so to speak. So I'm going to be going over all of this in my free workshop on Saturday, this coming Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern. And all you need to do to sign up is go to my website, go to the events page, and the link is right there. When you sign up, you'll not only get the Zoom link for the workshop, you'll also download the actual detail of how to decode a cue. And so you'll get that as a handout. You can use that not only for the workshop, but for your reference ongoing. So having said that, I want to launch into an introduction of today's guest. Dr. Pete Kadushin is a mental performance coach and educator. Pete brings with him a passion for helping people grow and over a decade of performance psychology and mental training experience. In addition, having taught both at Western Colorado University and Boston University, Pete has had the privilege of working with a wide array of athletes, coaches, first responders, and businesses with the goal of helping them to perform closer to their physical and mental best more consistently. So 
I'm really just so excited having just recorded this episode with Pete today and learning more about him. He brings a wealth of knowledge uh, to the podcast and a whole host of super relevant scenarios that I know are going to hit home with so many of you. So let's start that episode now. All right. Well, hi, everybody. I am here on the podcast and I am super excited to do an interview episode today, which um, if you've been a a listener of the podcast, you know, sometimes I go off on my own and I do solo episodes. But over the years, I have had guests on and I always like to kind of organically find people to be on the podcast. There are some times where I kind of go out in search of someone with a particular area of expertise, but I absolutely love how this particular guest for today's episode came to be. And I want to just give you just a really quick snippet. So I recently moved and in my new place, I have space to see students privately for yoga sessions. And one of the um, students who contacted me for private yoga sessions is a teacher uh, who took a teacher training that I taught the anatomy section for. And he had an injury, wanted to start private yoga sessions, came to the first session and mentioned he was in contact and and had a a professor that uh, he referenced as Dr. K. And I was like, tell me more about this Dr. K person. And as it turned out, he went into his background and right away I said, I am looking for someone like that with that background, with that focus to come on the podcast. So I'm sure listeners, you're kind of dying to know, I wonder what area of expertise he, he's in. Is he a closet organizer? Is he a, like, a rock star? What possible Ayurvedic medicine? What, what area are we going to talk about today? And what we're going to talk about today is performance coaching, mental coaching, and Dr. K is here live and in person. Well, not in person, but on the, on the video, which you guys can see, which I can see. Uh, so I want to introduce you to Dr. Pete Kadushin, and he is here to talk to us about all things performance coaching. And I'm super excited to have him here. So welcome to conversations for yoga teachers, right? You probably didn't wake up this morning thinking I'm going to be in a yoga teacher podcast, but here you are. <laughs> Oh, this is super exciting. And I'll be honest in a, another universe, maybe I would have been a rock star. Uh, that was, <laughs> okay. that was a dream once upon a time. Okay. Now it's just a guitar sitting in the corner of the room. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, first, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm super course. excited to be here. Uh, yeah. The background is in sport and exercise psychology, really performance psychology. And, uh, and so the work that I do, I think there's a ton of overlap in terms of uh, what your listeners are going to be able to get out of this. And I'm just super excited to get started. Yeah, for sure. And it's funny, like, as I'm, I mean, we did a pre interview or pre podcast interview chat. um, And I don't think I picked up on it as much, but I think you could also be in radio because you have a really good radio voice. So I know you're planning on starting a podcast yourself. So that will really come in handy. It's I think the listeners are really going to be soothed by your, your soothing voice. So um, I'd love for you, you know, and again, we can kind of frame this to a certain extent for the listener and the majority of listeners of my podcast are yoga teachers and my expertise is in teaching anatomy to yoga teachers so they can share it with their students in understandable ways. However, you know, we don't, I don't necessarily want you to kind of reframe what you're going to say to meet that population or that niche segment of of practitioners in the wellness space. I really wanted to have you on because I think performance coaching and just kind of all of what goes into that, both from the perspective of what you do when you work with people and what people who come to see you are facing as challenges. I think some of those things are agnostic in terms of, you could be a yoga teacher, you could be a, um, um, a coach, uh, you know, like a sports coach, you could be a fitness trainer. You know, there's so many areas, all of whom could be listening to my podcast where they're gonna be dealing with clients that are facing challenges. And also they are going to be facing challenges. So I think a lot of what I want to get into will serve kind of both aspects. You know, the teacher and the student is opposite sides of the same hand. So I think a good place to start is for you to tell us a little bit about 
your background and how you got into the work you do today and why. Yeah, my origin story, I was an athlete growing up and played a bunch of different sports. But by the time I got to high school, I was a wrestler. That was the, the first time I really remember wanting something very badly mm -hmm. uh, and putting a ton of effort and energy into it. And uh, what was really frustrating was I could perform really well in practice. I could hang with anybody. Uh, and then I would get out on the mat under the big spotlight. Uh, and if it was a pressure situation, if things were pretty even, I thought I might win, but I might lose. Uh, I choked a lot. And so I, it was one of those things that I couldn't transfer the skills that I had. And uh, being a good, studious young man, I, uh, I went and I, I read a book. Um, and then read another book. And my dad's actually a psychologist. So the language of psychology was in the house. And so it was something where I started to think about what was going on in between my ears that was getting in the way. Uh, and from there, it was uh, exciting stuff. It didn't quite <laughs> solve the riddle of my, my wrestling career. And uh, by the time I'd made it to graduate school, I'd realized that I really wanted to focus on how to help people do the things that they love. And so for me now, it's not just sport, but it's how to build positive habits around exercise or nutrition. Uh, but it's really, what is it that you want to do that's meaningful in your life? And how can I help facilitate the mental skills and the mindset that are going to allow you to do that at a really high level over and over again, really consistently? Mm -hmm. So how, how do you do that? Like, what's the modality? The first thing that comes to my mind is, talk therapy, but I don't know. Are you calling it therapy? Tell us about that. I think the, the trap that's easy to fall into is, is when you're talking about something, it feels like you're making change. And so I'd, I'd work with clients and they'd be fired up and I'd be fired up and they'd leave. And then they'd come back the next week and I'd be like, great, what are you doing different? And the answer was, oh, I don't know. We should talk about it some more. And so I think what I've really shifted to is thinking about this like you would strength and conditioning or any other type of coaching that's uh, physical in modality. Mm -hmm. And so if we're trying to get you stronger, we need to give you exercises that target that specific muscle or that specific movement. And then we need to progressively challenge that so that you're always kind of right on the edge of your comfort zone. And then we need to rest and recover so that you can grow into that challenge. Mm. And so the hard work is really figuring out how to take things like energy management and attention control and uh, engaging your self-talk and turning those into actionable drills and exercises that a client could actually be working on in between each session. And then we come back and say, okay, how, how did you integrate that into training? How did you integrate that into a game or a, a performance? And we try and level up like you would uh, if you were going to the gym. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you say that because, and let me just kind of reflect back. So it sounds like you're saying the talk alone you found isn't enough. And people tend to kind of, I don't want to say this in a detrimental way, talk a good game to a certain extent, but then life gets in the way and the self-limiting beliefs get in the way. And then they'll come back to you and they'll probably not feel so great that, well, I'm not making good progress. And so what you're saying is there needs to be actions that you take on, on a physical level, you know, kind of new habits that you need to build by doing something to change the feeling part. Is there a relationship there? It's, it's a lot harder to think your way into a, a different way of acting than it is to act your way into a different way of thinking. Okay. I think is the, stop, stop for a second. you need to say that again, because that is kind of mind blowing. Can you just, do you remember what you just said? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I got it. I got it. Uh, it's, that it's much harder to think your way into a different way of acting than it is to act your way into a different way of thinking. And that's really the crux of, you know, we were talking a game. It wasn't just the client. It was the client and I were into it. And, you know, the first step is always building awareness. If you don't see what's going on, you can't change it purposefully. And there needed to be a step after that. And so if we just talked about it, then you're kind of stuck in between your ears. Things are swirling and going, that sounds like a great idea, but the behaviors are already still grooved. The habits that you've had haven't been addressed directly. Mm -hmm. And so the second step after that talk and awareness building, really clarifying what it is that needs to change is then 
systematically changing that by actually acting different in between this session and next session. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting though, because when you think about the, I don't know, hundreds of years of approaching behavior change and, and even at the level of, you know, diagnostic, you know, changes to people who have clinical scenarios talking has always been the traditional modality to affect change. We we're seeing a, a shift in third wave therapies around uh, really that the psychology piece of it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, I don't in, do therapy or counseling. And so I really focus on through the lens of performance, how can we improve? Mm-hmm. And it doesn't change the fact that as these modalities have evolved, so things like EMDR that allow for really integrating brain biology and the thoughts and feelings that you have, or yeah, things like what EMDR stands for. I know. Oh, you know, this is something I shouldn't have steered us this direction because I don't, I don't actually know. Okay, I think it's, I mean, I'm, is this the, I actually, let me think about it. I actually don't know what the acronym stands for, but I'm trying to think in, in practical application, is it brain waves or is it? So it's, it's a combination. So you use, um, in some of the therapy, there's a, a light that moves back and forth so that your eyes are tracking to, oh, yes, yes, in, yes. to integrate yeah. both sides of your brain, or you might tap on each side of your body to integrate. Yes. And so it's, it's really thinking about the left side of your brain, the right side of your brain, and pulling those together within the context of the talk that's also happening. Right, right, right. Uh, yes, and the, I have heard of it that way, yeah. You know, uh, acceptance and commitment therapy grew out of uh, this understanding of language and how language does a really poor job in the end of encapsulating our entire experience. It's just not good enough to really get at those things that are super, super human mm-hmm. that we're going like, well, I don't know how to put that into words. And Mm -hmm. so we're starting to notice that, again, it's nothing against, you have to be able to talk about it to really know it or write about it at least, because again, the awareness is the first step, but there's has to be something after that, that helps change behavior to go along with the changing of the thoughts and the feelings. Mm -hmm. So when you say performance, like, it sounds like you're kind of making a slight distinction between kind of talk therapy, psychology and performance coaching. Now, when I think performance coaching, two things that come to my mind are either like a type A executive who is working in a job and wants to like perform really well. Um, And then I think of an athlete, whether that's a college athlete, a high school athlete, college athlete, weekend warrior type, a, a really good golfer, you know, like not necessarily someone in school. So can you talk a little bit about what is performance coaching and who's getting it? Like what kinds of clients you're seeing? Yeah, the, the field evolved out of sports psychology specifically. And so it really began around uh, the, the things that you just mentioned in terms of the athletics piece, uh, oh. whether it was amateur athletes after they'd already graduated college, all the way down to youth athletes and understanding really how to have a perspective of more fun and engaging a growth mindset. And what ended up happening was there was people who were out there doing executive coaching and there are people out there who were working with musicians and there are people working and it, all of it started to pull together under this umbrella of performance psychology. And so I've worked with musicians and actors. I've worked with um, first responders and tactical athletes. Um, I've also worked with businesses and uh, you know managers. And then of course, also with athletes and exercisers. And so uh, it really runs the gamut in terms of what is performance. I think, you know, we're, we're performing almost all day, every day. Mm. Uh, and so thinking about what are the meaningful performances, because you can't be great at everything for the entire day for your entire life. Mm-hmm. And so really thinking about where is it most important, whether it's as a parent or it's in the boardroom or it's standing on stage, even though this is your hobby, right? If you've got your, uh, you know, Pink Floyd cover band, and that's the thing that you love, then we can talk about how to build mental skills and then the appropriate trusting mindset so that you can go out there and be grounded, be present, and be able to really pour your energy into that without getting in your own way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as you're talking, of course, I'm thinking about how this would all relate to a yoga teacher. And of course, in the beginning, I said, let's not steer the conversation there, but um, I don't want to do that. I guess, though, what I'm curious about is 
you know, because I definitely don't think of yoga teaching as performing, but I do know from coaching teachers, there is a lot that comes up for yoga teachers when they stand in front of a room and have to teach. And they always, um, not always, but sometimes they'll make that, they'll kind of remark to me how amazing it is that they've been a student of yoga for many years and they thought teaching it would be super easy but those first handful of times they had to stand up and articulate that which they knew so intrinsically in their body, it was so much harder than they thought. So that is in a way a performance of sorts, right? And taking something that you would think, I know so well, I've heard this phrase, these phrases over and over again, I know these poses, but all this other stuff comes up when I have to be the leader, be the teacher. So you've probably, whether it's a yoga teacher or all those other avatars that you mentioned, you know, the, the executive or the high school athlete, what are some of the things that come up for people that become these like obstacles to, to just naturally being themselves and expressing whatever it is you know, whether it's wrestling or golf or yoga teaching, what, what are some of these things? Yeah. One of the, I love that you said obstructed because one of my favorite ways to think of peak performance or the end goal of what I'm trying to do with clients is really give them the un, unobstructed self-expression. So how can through their chosen modality, how can they be the most themselves? Yes. Uh, and for me, you know, whether you get the gold medal or whether you win yoga teacher of the year, Right. You've, you've, do they, have really, that? do they have that? They have to have a yoga teacher Olympics, right? It seems think. like a great marketing opportunity. <laughs> okay. Maybe, uh, maybe I'll look into building that. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> I, I think that that ends up being a really great definition for our end target because it's really about the process. It's a bait and switch around, you know, you don't get to the top of the mountain. It's, it's how you're moving up the mountain as you go. And with the things that come up most frequently, I think are that generally you're trying to think your way through it as opposed to just let your training do it. Now, early on in a, a yoga teacher's experience, what's really challenging is the skills of teaching yoga are not the same as the skills of being on the mat doing yoga. Right. And so there's absolutely a learning curve. And this is true for anybody who shifts from doing something to trying to teach or coach is it's it's a whole different set of skills. And so if you're measuring yourself to a certain bar, the expectation is this should be easy because I'm just good at yoga. Now, all of a sudden, when you're performing underneath your expectations, well, what happens when there's a gap there? There's all of a sudden some thinking, your brain starts to shift into that fight or flight mode. You're going like, well, there's a potential threat because if I say something stupid up here, somebody's going to snicker, right? I can see that person in the back. They just shifted their eyes funny. Now, all of a sudden we're scanning the room and then we're scanning my, our internal experience for what could go wrong. What's already going wrong. Oh man, my hands are a little sweaty now. I, I know this pose. Why did I suddenly forget what this pose is called? And so that gap between expectation and then how you're actually arriving in the moment can be a huge barrier, but regardless of how you get there, generally what's going on when people are struggling is uh, that they can't get out of their own way. That's really amazing that you, you just expressed like literally what teachers feel and you've never taught a yoga class now, have you? I, I have not. Right. Um, so that, that's really interesting to me as someone who spends hours coaching yoga teachers and as a yoga teacher who has felt all the things that you just expressed. So I, I guess I'm wondering, how did you know that? How were you able to so clearly put yourself in the shoes of, I mean, there must be something that's kind of a general template for how people, what, what these obstacles are. Otherwise, I don't know. How, how did you do that? <laughs> I have, I have two answers. The first is that this is actually what I love about my job is that there's, you know, people ask, what's your favorite type of person to work with? And the answer is it's just who the person who's in front of me, because it doesn't matter what sport or how you define performance. There's such a commonality. There's this universality of being human and what it means to want to do a really great job. And then the struggle, sometimes the struggle, sometimes the grace 
of getting to that point where you're in this moment operating really close to peak performance, right? That unobstructed self-expression. And so whether it's teaching yoga or it's being out on a, a soccer pitch or it's running an ultra marathon, there's going to be some really common ways that we approach things. And, and it's not so much cookie cutter. Everybody's got the same issues. It's really, they're expressed differently because we're all unique, right? right? But there's, when we cook it down, there's some essential humanness that's underneath it. And so that's the first answer. The second answer is I taught for seven years at university. And so I know what it's like to have a bunch of students stare at you and go, either give me the good stuff or get off the stage. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I could see that. But see, even in that context of teaching students in university, they can talk to you so you can get a beat. In yoga teaching, no one's talking to you. You are the only one talking. So that adds even more of what you described. And it's what can conjure up such anxiety in teachers, because just as you said in your example, which was amazing that you brought this example up, which is so true, you do look at people's eye movements and start to make assumptions about what their what that look that they gave you means when it could mean something completely different or what that, you know, move they just did when you tried to give them a yoga block and they kind of pushed it to the side or didn't take the prop that you gave them because you had a reason for giving it to them. Now you're all up in your head in the middle of teaching the class because that person just kind of pushed to the side the block that you gave to them. There could be so many other things. So I think it, it even heightens all these things more because they're not talking to you. Um, one thing though that you're bringing up has me thinking about, you know, I, I was raised in a family where my parents are both quite type A and so therefore I am type A and I have vivid memories of growing up and sitting at the dining room table with my father and he would help me with homework. And if I wasn't getting, getting it, he would get upset and I would get upset and that whole dynamic. And I think a lot about that as I, you know, get older and older and just some of the hangups that I have. And I think how much that tracks back. So I guess part of what I was thinking as you were describing it is how much does you know, your upbringing and the way you were raised impact how you look at taking on challenges and how you look at being authentic and showing up. I mean, is that mixed in there as well as what you describe as kind of there are some common things that you see in people? Well, I guess what's really cool is the, the last example and then this question really are unified around this the sense that we are really great storytellers, right? Human beings see patterns and then we, we tell ourselves stories about those. And so whether mm -hmm. it's that person who's shifting their eyes or pushing the block away after you just gave them a very generous comment on how to do it differently, right? That's, that's creating a story. Then we go, oh, they must have, and then we fill in the blank. Right. And how we write those stories often comes from how people around us have written those stories. And so early on, we learn from our parents or our caregivers. We learn from our coaches and our teachers, right? So the people who are significant that we trust and we look up to, and then of course our peer group and then uh, significant others later on in, the, in, in our lives, these people all shape the way we tell our stories by how they tell our stories. We learn what to value, what's important, what isn't important. Uh, and that all gets kind of plugged in under the surface. And so you're going back to step one, which is always awareness. If you don't know the values that are driving the bus, if you don't know the shadow values that are just like three or four steps behind the ones that you can readily identify mm -hmm. and then figure out how they're moving you around, then it's really hard to make consistent change because you know we can rearrange the outside facing stuff. You can talk a little bit different to your teammates or you can use a trick to coach somebody on the mat a little bit differently. But if the way that you're constructing the narrative, if you see that person push the block away and it means the same thing to you every time, and what that means gets interpreted as, oh, well, they know that I'm clearly new at this. And, you know, I try really hard, but I'm never going to live up to, you know, fill in the blank, your favorite yoga teacher. Because we always kind of uh, smash together all of our mentors and idols and go, well, one day I'm going to be that person 
who doesn't exist and is perfect. And that's a oh, totally unreasonable yeah. measure to hold us to. Right? So we, we construct these stories and then we feel like we have to live up to them. And when we don't, right, we get that sense of threat and it moves our physiology into fight or flight. And then that affects our attention, which affects our energy and things really can tend to spiral from there. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know if I answered your question, yeah, but I talked said, around I mean, it. Every time that you share something, it has me thinking about other aspects under the same umbrella, because, you know, I think part of, you know, there's kind of that. And I, I always think about it, obviously through the lens of yoga teaching, but even just how we live our lives as humans through that lens, that very general lens. Um, so the other kind of related thing to your environment and how you were raised and who influenced you as, as a young person. I think about even from that and those experiences, the identities that people think they have. And this is something that I hear a lot from teachers, especially because I teach anatomy. I'll hear them say things like, I'm not really good at science. I'm not really good with memorizing things. Um, when you know, they want to invest in my program, they'll say, I don't have the money. I I don't think I'll ever have the money. So all these kinds of things that fall into identities that seem to be things that people hold on to really tightly. So how, how do you help people get unstuck from their attachment to those identities? A lot of which can really get in the way from them being confident and clear and, and authentic when they do whatever it is that they're doing. Yeah. I I think the challenge around identity is that it's now a set of stories and they all strengthen themselves, right? right? They all hold together like, uh, like this house that you've built out of all these different narratives. And so you start to peel off like the, the shutters over here, but you still have the rest of the house. And by the time you come back around, right, the shutters got put back up that limiting belief or that story about how you're not smart enough, how this part of your physicality isn't good enough or whatever it might be. And so there's a couple of things that we need to do when we're working with a client like that, that I think are effective. The first is if you don't believe you can change, then you're not going to change. And so what I really try and approach is thinking about how to set up the framework of my interaction with the assumption of change. Everything about how I engage a client, including you know, the, the recap form that they get that has their homework and all the things that we talked about, uh, the way that I ask them to reflect, right, where they're really focusing on how they're continuing to get better. All of that builds towards this sense of the thing that I think is stuck, whether it's an identity or whatever other quality that I say, you know what, I was born with it, it's talent or not talent, that's it. That we're really thinking, I'm asking them to think about it differently without sometimes even saying, here's how you need to think about this differently. Mm -hmm. the other important thing that we need to do is recognize that those identities and those narratives that we've are telling ourselves might be really maladaptive in certain ways, right? They're holding us back from getting to the next level, Mm -hmm. whether I went from, you know, successful here, but I want to shift jobs or uh, I'm great at yoga, but now I want to teach yoga or I teach yoga, but now I want to make it my full time, whatever that next, usually what got you to this level isn't what's going to get you to the next one. Right. And so these narratives that have, um, you know, congealed around identity, it's useful to recognize and and honor the fact that they got you to where they did. And this is actually when we engage the inner critic with clients. It's usually, I always want it to be from a place of compassion. You know, that voice on your shoulder, that's usually really, really nasty, right? You'll say stuff to yourself that you won't say to anybody else on the planet. True. When you notice that voice, rather than getting critical about your inner critic, which ends up just, you know, it's like trying to wash blood with blood. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Instead, we're trying to look at it from a place of compassion. You're here to help, right? The narratives and those uh, self-limiting beliefs, they're all there to keep me safe. And because on some level they worked, they got me to where I'm standing, where my feet are right now. And so we start with that perspective, which I think, you know, offering a little bit of grace just a little bit of an exhale. And Mm. then the client can go, okay, well, I don't have to be a jerk to myself all the time. Mm. And from there, it's about setting up very small experiments, Mm -hmm. right? Because these systems that are in place, the narratives and the stories, they're there to keep the status quo, status quo, right? That's safe. When things don't change, that's safe. 
And so we need to come up with really, really small experiments, right? You don't think that you're any good speaking in public. What's the smallest way I can get you in front of, you know, quote unquote, somebody in public where you can say something and then notice that you didn't die when that happened, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to put you in front of a thousand people on a stage straight away, mm -hmm. right? But we're going to make little progress that starts to dismantle those beliefs and those narratives. And then we need to continue to point at it. We need to continue to say, ah, notice that you keep thinking that you're shy or you keep thinking that you're no good at this. Or, hey, you know, you said you aren't flexible, but I just noticed you touched your feet right? from a, you know, fold right in half. There you are. And so it's, it's working on those two tracks, I think, mm -hmm. uh, and trying to be able to switch back and forth and kind of juggle those at the same time. Mm -hmm. I guess I wonder too, as you're kind of running through this, this whole topic of self-limiting beliefs, I've always in my own life experienced that as I start to peel away the layers, what I really find underneath it all is that I'm afraid of something. You know, whether it's I'm afraid of failing or I'm afraid of being judged. Like the example you gave, I'm afraid of making a mistake. Um, and whether or not that tracks back to some literal experience I had where I can logically say, see, that happened. So I'm not crazy. This is, you know, something that happened that proved me right. I should be afraid of this. So if that is something that's underneath a lot of this, how do you, you know, for someone listening who, you know, maybe is aware that there's a fear of making a change, there's something that, as you say, is keeping them safe, but it's, it's a behavior that's not allowing them to grow. So how did they push through it? Think of, you know, I mean, I, is part of it that you need to change the behaviors rather than trying to continue to, as you said at the beginning, think yourself out of the fear? I think the, the trap that we fall into a lot is that at some point I'm going to rearrange the, the wires in my head and that fear won't be there anymore, right? And then I'll be able to move forward or I'll rewire the way that things are up there and the anxiety will go away. Whatever the thing that is making me feel unsafe will, will be gone and then I'll take the next step. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason this gets us into trouble, you know, earlier we talked about, you can't think your way into a different way of acting. And this right. is really getting at some of the heart of why that's true, which is really what I'm trying to shift to with clients is that feeling can be there and it's not that big a deal. And I don't want to minimize somebody's fear, right? Cause it can be paralyzing in the moment or their anxiety or their anger or their frustration or their shame. And so we always want to start with honoring and making sure that we approach this experience with compassion right? Uh, for ourself first, before you know, put your oxygen mask on, before you put on anybody else, put your compassion mask on before you give it at anybody else. And after that, what we really need to approach is trying to understand. I'm trying to think of the best way to phrase this, uh, right? They're there for a reason those feelings, those self-limiting beliefs. And if I get captured by them, right? if I allow the, the fear around that, oh, I feel unsafe now, then I'm never going to actually make progress moving forward. Mm -hmm. And so if I have strategies and skills that allow me to unhook from that, right, that they can just be part of the, the weather in my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for me, mindfulness is uh, and meditation are one of the, the key components to the work that I do because it builds awareness. Again, that's step one, but it also shifts my, my relationship to my mind. I don't have to hold my best performance hostage and go, all right, until the conditions in between my ears are perfect, I'm not going to live up to my ideals. Instead, we train performers, whether it's athletes or any other, anybody else, that when anxiety shows up, I can still act in accordance with my values. I have tools and techniques that say, I don't have to get captured by fear or anxiety. And then I can still go out and have a great day. I can be nervous before my first teach, uh, my experience teaching, right. take a few deep breaths, ground myself in my body because yoga teaches you the mindfulness to do that and then show up my best no matter what. Right. Yeah. It's funny when you mentioned in that, this last piece here, that idea of like acknowledging how you feel 
and still moving forward, right? So it's like, whatever it is, yeah, I noticed that I'm afraid of this scenario or in this scenario, I feel fear. I can acknowledge that and still move forward rather than, I think how you juxtapose this was so great saying, I'm gonna do all this stuff to try to get the fear away and then feeling fearless, I'm gonna do the thing. And first of all, how do you know you're ever gonna get there? And on some level, I think when you, when you hear any of the stories of like amazing athletes or anyone who's done anything, even outside of sports at a high performance level, they often acknowledge that they were unsure and nervous and leery about if this was gonna work and they did the thing anyway and it worked, whatever it was. Well, and the amazing thing about anxiety or fear or anger uh, is that it's really just a manifestation of energy. And so if I can allow that to be no big deal, and then I step in front of the, the classroom or I get to the starting line, all of a sudden I might find that that energy can actually be available to me to do a better job, to actually you know, express myself without that blocking my ability to do that. Right. And so it, it sometimes actually becomes the slingshot that allows you to be even better and you know, perform at a higher level. And if you do this over and over again, the, the benefit is that we actually start to expand our zone of tolerable discomfort. And so what used to feel uncomfortable now no longer does. And now I have just a, a further edge in terms of my comfort zone. I get to go explore that. Um, a, a concrete physical example I use, uh, especially it resonates for me because I don't like cold water. And so uh, the first time you take a cold shower, you feel like you're going to die. If you take cold showers for a week in a row, by the time you get to day seven, it's still super unpleasant, right? Like I, I, it's, it's not like I'm having fun and it's no big deal. Now, the challenge here though, is if I stop for another month and then I come back, it feel like I'm going to die the very first time I do this. And so it really gives us a physical template for what it looks like to engage our, our anxiety and our fear. If I'm living in my comfort zone, right in the, the center where everything's like super cushy and it's just bean bags and butterflies. And if I'm hanging out there and then I tiptoe out to the edge of my comfort zone, it feels super uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. If I hang out there and then I make sure to take time to rest and recover, and then I step back to the edge again the next day, and I do that for seven or eight or 10 days in a row. Now, all of a sudden I go, well, yeah, this isn't such a big deal. You know, I'm in front of this group of people and I'm talking. And I'm still a little nervous, but I can handle that nervous. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I think it becomes a practice. If we can do this, again, finding the balance, because if you just stand on the precipice of your uncomfort zone, uh, eventually you burn out. And right. so it's finding that balance, that uh, rhythm between stress and release and doing that so that we can continue to expand and grow into uh, the opportunity to impact people and do the things that we love at a higher level. Mm -hmm. Would you say, because when you were mentioning having these feelings of fear on some level can propel us forward, would you kind of classify that as the difference between, you know, good stress and bad stress when people refer to that kind of thing? Yes. I think that when we think there's a couple different ways to think about stress, right? And so if we want to really ground it in the body then it's really just the, our physiological mobilizing of resources, right? So my heart rate goes up, there's an increased muscle tension. And if that saber tooth tiger drops out of the tree, like I'm ready to run or right. ready to fight. That ends up feeling a lot of different ways. And so being on a roller coaster for some people, great feeling, it's excited. Other people get on a roller coaster and it's terrifying. And so the difference for me is in between the years. If it feels threatening, if it feels like the challenge is bigger than my skills, then I'm probably going to have a negative experience. If it's exciting, right? And it, it, it's something that I'm excited to approach. And I feel like the actual, my skills are bigger than the challenge. Then I go, all right, well, this is probably a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I try and take some of the good and bad out of stress and think about more of, is it productive or unproductive? Is okay. it getting me closer to what I want? And too much of a, a productive thing ends up becoming an unproductive thing is mm -hmm. if I'm, 
you know, on a roller coaster every day of my life for hours, I might end up with adrenal fatigue. And right. so uh, right. again, it's, right. it comes back to balance too. Yeah. Cortisol. I was thinking of that. So tell me this, like, I think this is a, a, a nice segue into something that I'm, I'm thinking that you might do with your clients, uh, the idea of visualization. And can you talk a little bit about how, because I've heard some things about how the mind can't really distinguish between you literally doing something and you imagining yourself doing something. And I've been taking like a super deep dive into um, neuroscience and neuro-linguistic programming over the past like year. And there's a lot of, there are a lot of techniques in NLP that have you visualizing things like let's just say something that was a really good experience where you really performed well and even adding other visualizations to the memory of it's a circle that you're stepping into and all of these good feelings are in that circle with you and then when you do the thing that's anxiety producing you imagine the circle around you and and all of those feelings are contained within so tell us a little bit about what happens when you're visualizing something that you want to do well, that you have fear around? And is that a helpful technique and why what's happening at the level of your nervous system and brain? That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot to answer, but anything that comes to you would be great. Cause I, I really do wonder, I know it's not hocus pocus because I've studied up on it enough and I've used the technique. And I think it's something really portable and relevant to yoga teachers. And it's something that I often encourage them to do. Imagine yourself teaching in the most authentic and powerful way. What would it look like? What would it feel like? Because they're often just stuck in what they feel now, which is, you know, uh, you know, I don't know enough about anatomy. I don't know how to cue effectively. I'm nervous because people are looking at me and on and on. I'll tackle the first part, which was what what's going on when we image. And, uh, and so there have been some studies that have looked at what your brain looks like when you're doing a movement and then what it looks like when you're engaging in the visualization around that movement. Mm -hmm. And what they found is that the same centers in your brain are firing when you're doing the movement mm -hmm. just at a, a lower amplitude. So it's not quite as intense. And we are still wiring those movements into our bodies by visualizing ourselves doing those movements. I think the same, again, I, I try and draw the parallel between physical and mental because I think there's so many principles that govern both. And so it's the same sort of idea underlying what happens when we're doing imagery uh, around some, you know, the example that you gave. So you're nervous when you're getting in front of the, a group of yoga students. And so then you're trying to see yourself act a different way is what we're really doing is we're grooving new neural pathways. Mm -hmm. uh, the way I describe it for folks is it's like, um, hacking your way into a new path through the jungle, mm. right? You want to take the easy path, the one that's been grooved already. It's nice and like super highway style. And instead, what we're generally asking you to do, if you need to think, feel, or act differently is grab your machete and start like, you know, whacking through the, uh, the underbrush. You're going to get scraped up. It's hard work. It's, it's, it's hot. You're muggy. And, and what imagery can help us do is without actually having to have the experience, we can create that experience and start to groove that path. Mm -hmm. And while is, you're hacking through, if you're nervous and all the stuff we talked about before, just keep going. Just. Well, I think what ends up being important is whatever you image is what you're getting better at doing. Just okay. like whatever you're doing is what you get better at doing, right? That's how habits get built. It's just behavior right. repeated. Right. And so if, and this is where I think that uh, the magic wand style of positivity can get into trouble. Right. So if I've imaged myself as being strong and, and radiating positivity, and then I get in front of the class that first time and it doesn't go the way that my imagery went, right? I visualized this a hundred times and I'm nervous. What ends up happening is there's this huge whiplash between what I want to have have happen, right? My expectation for how this was going to unfold and then how I'm actually feeling in the moment. And so we want to be really particular, really I'm purposeful is a better word really purposeful with the images we create. And we want to respect the fact that if I get anxious, well, what am I going to do with that? So what I would recommend is if you were going to image yourself in front of the class, you might want to start with, you know, how am I going to hold myself, right? Think about what does it feel like in my body? And then really 
it, we're trying to engage all five senses and the kinesthetic sense, right? My body's uh, awareness of where it is in relation to itself. So bringing myself into that space and the more vivid I can be, right? So if I can be in, in the, the classroom before I actually get a chance to be in there with any students, right? I can actually see the space, mm-hmm. right? If there's going to be a uh, certain music playing, I can put that music on while I image. Oh, yeah. And so I might start with just how do I want to bring myself to the space, right? Mm-hmm. And the, the thing that I think trips people up with imagery most is that we bite off huge chunks, right? So I'm going to image the entire yoga class that I'm about to teach. And if okay. you haven't done a lot of imagery, we're thinking like 20 second snippets, not 20 minute or 40 minute snippets. Okay. And so the 20 seconds of introducing yourself to the class, can you see that? And what comes up when you do? So if you get nervous doing that because you've created such a vivid experience, this is now an opportunity to think about, okay, well, what, what will I do when I start to feel nervous? Because mm-hmm. if I try and stuff that down, pretend like I'm still positive and radiating, you know, joy and, and all the good stuff, I'm going to end up in that conflict, right? There's going to be tension in my body, which means there's going to be tension in my teaching. Mm-hmm. So then this is the opportunity to plug in the mental skills, right? So the, the chance to notice what's happening and then go, ah, but I don't need to get carried away by that thought. Mm-hmm. I can actually just take a deep breath and I can bring myself back to the feeling in my feet on the floor. Mm-hmm. Right. Or I can pick a spot in the room where I can anchor myself physically in the space. I can look to the top left corner and I go, that's there. I'm here. Ah, we're, we're back to the present moment mm-hmm. and train ourselves through the imagery then to say, you know what? The anxious feeling in my stomach is really just a feeling in my stomach. It's energy that's hanging out down there. And then let me bring myself back to what's most important. Mm. So what's most important is up to the person who's doing the imagery. And then again, who's in the space, right? Mm -hmm. But right there, it's probably conveying your excitement or your welcoming attitude to the the students who are coming in, setting the tone. And so I can let that thing drift off that got me distracted. And then I can come back to that. And if I image that whole thing and I have to scaffold and build over time to get to that whole two minutes. Mm -hmm. But if I can do that, now what I've trained is my ability to actually be resilient in the moment. I'm not scripting the way it's going to go, but I am showing my body and my mind that whatever shows up, I can trust that I have the tools to handle it and then still do what I'm here to do, which is, you know, teach yoga. Yeah. I'm wondering too, and I'm just, I'm mindful of the time. It's amazing how fast time has gone since we started this conversation. I have two more things to ask. One thing I definitely want to ask. And another thing I'm just thinking of in the moment, um, uh, when you had said in the beginning or of our conversation, this idea of making change. I don't know if you said has to start or should start with the desire to change. And so part of what I'm thinking of, it kind of reminds me of someone who's addicted to let's say alcohol and that, that whole conversation around the person didn't change until they hit rock bottom. And then at that point, they decided to make a change. And that's when things really started to shift for them. And so I'm wondering, you know, we're not obviously talking about substance abuse. However, whatever someone's challenges to living their most authentic life or performing in whatever thing we're talking about to the best of their ability in a way that fills their heart with joy at, and on, you know, all the, all the happy things, um, what if they aren't willing? Like, what if there's a resistance or they just, I don't know if it's that they're not ready. Do you kind of get where I'm going? Like, does it have to start with some kind of internal switch that flips um, before momentum can be gained? Are you asking me if I know how to do mind control? <laughs> that's that's where that's this where is headed, isn't it? Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, because it's funny. I remember somebody was, telling a story there was some it's not a parable but it was some kind of story that people tell something about an old man was sitting on a porch and I don't know if you ever heard this and and there was a dog at his feet and the dog was whimpering and the person came by and said why is the dog whimpering and he said oh because he's sitting on a nail and the whole moral of the story was the dog wasn't in pain enough to move so he was just kind of accepting that he was on this nail and his whimpering was just his 
way of alerting people, yeah, this is uncomfortable, but not enough that I'm going to get up. And so it makes me think about, you know, whether you're a yoga teacher who feels blocked from teaching in the most authentic, effective way possible for you or a performer or a executive, whatever it is, on some level, something's got to shift inside you to have you get to the point where you say enough is enough. I'm now going to move forward despite the fears I have and everything else I have. And my question to you is if they, if that person doesn't get to that point, it doesn't seem like any amount of, of techniques and, you know, approach would help them. Yeah. I I was, I was teasing a little bit and the underlying message I think holds, which is um, I don't, and I don't think anybody else really knows how to do mind control. Even with like hypnosis, you have to give permission in order to be put in a trance like that. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to the motivation to change, what great coaches do, what great teachers do, what great parents do is they actually create the conditions either with their words or with the environment or with the tasks that they give that person. They create the conditions that unlock the desire and the energy to change in the person themselves, right? I can't give you motivation right? Any more than I can beam over some confidence. Right. But what I can do is I can set up the, the challenge that's in front of you so that you can be excited about what happens next. And that speaks to, I think, you know, the, the parable of the dog on the nail, right? One of the reasons we move is because of the pain of our current situation, right? Right. Uh, this is so painful. I've come back around and around again, whether it's, you know, my hip hurts every time I try and do that exercise, I finally need to get that hip taken care of, or, uh, you know, each re- relationship ends this way. I got to start doing something different in relationships. It can be pain that drives us and it's a powerful motivator. And the trouble is that it usually takes lots and lots of times hearing the lesson before we actually make the change. The other way that we might change is when we consider the pain of not getting to where we're going, right? So it's not focused on the nail, but it's looking over next to the nail and going, oh, that actually looks really tasty. That's a good spot to lay down, right? Maybe there's a bed and it's closer to the fire. And you know what? When I put myself in that space as a dog, that sounds really, really nice. Mm. And so it's still, you can frame it through excitement or approach, but you could also look at it as the pain of staying where you are because you never get to where you want to go. You never get to feel that sense of unobstructed self-expression. You never get to make the impact with the students or the athletes or the people around you. And so we can frame it as where you're going and the journey that you're going on is really, really powerful. This is exciting. And that that's one way to get there. Our role, I think, as the outside person is to help ask questions and create an environment that allows people to uncover what's already inside and then connect to that on a regular basis so that there isn't this sense of a power outage until things get really terrible and they go, all right, now I've got the energy to change. Right. It kind of reminds me of at the end of The Wizard of Oz when she says, like, if I had the power to go home the whole time by clicking my heels, why didn't you just tell me? And they were like, well, you had to figure it out for yourself. It was kind of, they could have told her at the beginning, but the lesson she learned by going through what she went through helped her appreciate that home is where the heart is and all of that. So to me, it kind of sounds like it's not my control, but as a coach, um, you know that if you kind of lay out enough crumbs, the person will start to take steps. And in that taking of steps, momentum will kick in and all of what you said before, the doing, despite the feeling of anxiety or fear, the doing will take over and then the doing will change thinking and go from there. Well, and, and it really speaks to two different t- styles of coaching or mentorship, right? There's the coaches out there that say that wasn't good enough to do it differently. And then my favorite way that I heard coaching defined is uh, you, my job is to see how awesome you already are and then convince you that's true. Ah, that's great. And, yeah, and so right. what it speaks to is I need to be able to time hop into the future right. and see you for who you can be in two weeks, six months, six years. Yeah. And then I need to do a systematic job of working backwards and saying, hey, take that next step and then see where we're going. 
and then take that next step, but also see where we're going. And again, it's not mind control. I'm not telling you you're going someplace that I want you to go, but you don't, right? right? They have to actually find that compelling vision of the future compelling. But if I can craft that as a coach and then you'll pick that person's eyes up and have them stare off into the future metaphorically, Right. And they can connect to that. All of a sudden we're, we're talking about cooking with like uh, sustainable energy. We're not talking about cooking with coal. Right. Well, it's the, be- it's the Stephen Covey begin with the end in mind. You know, here's where we want to end up. Now let's reverse engineer how we're going to get there. But as you say, that's not the whole story. It's along the way, reminding people, this is where we're headed because along the way is where the pitfalls come up and where you could go back to square one if you let fear take over. All right, so in the last five minutes here, I want to see, cause we kind of spent the majority of the time which has been awesome kind of talking at the level of, you know, feeling and, and motivation and, and obstacles that people face. And you've kind of peppered into the conversation some of the tactical stuff you do when you work with people. I know you mentioned like worksheets and homework and stuff like that. So I guess I'm just wondering for the listener who's like super like jazzed up by all you're talking about, how can they get even in small ways kind of tactical with themselves to start to move forward? Are there some things like, should they be, should we be visualizing every day on a particular goal we have? Should we be, I don't know, making lists of something? I don't know. Tell me what, what you would suggest. Well, I, I think that the, the template we put in there just a little bit ago around uh, imagery holds true. And so you always want to start with purpose. If you're leaving something up to chance, it's going to end up on accident. So and vision so, boards are good. We should be making vision boards. Is that? <laughs> well, again, this idea of uh, being able to choose with purpose the next 20 seconds, what I'm going to see, particularly yeah. around how I want to show up for the next important thing, whether it's today or tomorrow and keeping it on a short term, I think is really valuable, but yeah. training that ability to time hop into the future and then see myself in a state of trust with my physical and my mental skills and my tactical skills ready to make the change that I want to make in the world. That would be one a technique that I think people can continue to grow into. Uh, and the beauty is that, again, whatever you practice gets better. And so as long as you're doing it with purpose, you can use that for any aspect of your life. So would you say under the category of visualization, I mean, I'm actually kind of serious about this, things like journaling and vision boarding, do they kind of fall into the same category as, as other tactics and techniques you can do to or is that kind of too woo-woo and out there in the manifesting crystals zone, which I well, love, by the way, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not completely science-based, but I'm just well, wondering, is that not in the same category? Well, the, the next thing I was going to recommend actually is to have a formalized practice around reflection. I mean, okay. Because one of the hardest things earlier, we talked about that fixed mindset versus growth mindset. Yeah. And one of the things that unloosens or uh, uh, loosens us up around that fixed mindset is reflecting with purpose. And so uh, writing it down is a must. And right? I recommend actually using a pen and paper because there's a, yes. it's wires, it's wired different in your mind than click clacking on a keyboard yes. or swiping uh, on your phone so and true. something's better than nothing. So it has to be out of your head and on either digital or actual analog paper. And the technique that I always coach because it's simple and it forces us to be positive and growth mindset oriented is called good, better, how, and it takes five minutes at the end of the day. Uh, and, and it's really simple. You start with what you did well that day. And this is really generally for the, the type a hard driving performers that I work with. This is the hardest part. You know, today was terrible. Here's all the things that didn't go well. And so it's training a shift in lens. It's actually teaching my brain and my mind to see the things that are going well that I normally just gloss over the top of. So I'm creating a more optimistic uh, perspective, which then affects the way I tell my stories moving forward. So we start with as much as you can. And so if this is around something specific, we'll use teaching yoga, right? So I taught yoga today. Here's all the things I did well. And then the answer is generally, well, nothing. Everything was terrible. You go, well, did you show up early and get the room set up? Right? Did you make sure to make eye contact? Did you say hi to students as they came in? Right? So all these things that we normally overlook and we take for granted, those go in the good because, we're, again, we're really trying to focus on training our mind to think and see differently. 
The next two are better how, and they go together. What most performers do is they, they pick eight different betters. Tomorrow, I'm going to do all these better, or they actually flip it because it's really built to be positive. Right? So they'll go, here's all the ways that I stunk today. And go, no, no, you only get to pick one. And the way that it's phrased is really important. What am I going to do better tomorrow? Mm -hmm. So it's future focused and it's already framed positively. So you pick the highest point of leverage. If I change this thing tomorrow, right, then a lot of other stuff gets better. You pick that and then you write yourself marching orders. That's what how is. You say concretely, here are the things that I'm going to do different. Remember, it's not how I'm going to think or feel differently. We're actually looking for actions. And so then here's the three small steps I can take leading up to tomorrow's yoga class that are going to allow me to do that better that I wrote down in that middle step, actually raise my game there. If you do this once, it's probably not that useful. If you do this for seven days in a row, you've now stacked seven purposeful days on top of them, themselves. If you do this for seven weeks in a row, right? It's compounding returns because I know how I'm getting better. Right? I don't have to worry about it after I've finished. This is actually the hidden benefit. I don't have to worry about that yoga class after I've done my evaluation. Five minutes, I close the door on it. I know how I'm going to improve tomorrow. I'm now free to go like eat my dinner, spend time with my family. Mm -hmm. I have permission to let it go. And then I know that I already know, um, I've got my marching orders for tomorrow and then I just do it again and do it again. And that's how growth happens. And right. so I would say that's another simple, but also not easy approach. Mm -hmm. to improving performance on purpose. Yeah. I mean, in a way it is kind of simple though, because you encapsulated it in such a succinct way. Good. You said good, better, how good, better, how, yeah. I mean, that is, is such a nugget that I think is so transferable to people. So this is like such a great note to kind of wrap up this conversation on. Cause I think you know, it gives people something really specific they can do. And, and I love the way you did connect it to yoga teaching and all of what you expressed is, is truly what people do. They get done teaching and they immediately start to say to themselves, these are all the things that went wrong. So the way you reframed it puts them in the driver's seat. And, um, and like you say, I, and of course, for right now, a lot of teachers are teaching virtually. So there's a whole host of other things that they're managing uh, that are affecting them and how they perceive themselves, especially when they teach classes and people don't even turn their cameras on. They can't even see the person. Mm -hmm. So um, that whole exercise after you close your computer from teaching your online class, do what you just said instead of sitting there and lamenting, oh, they didn't even have their cameras on. They don't want to have me see them or I didn't have interaction because I couldn't see them. It's a way of turning that on its head. So that's, that's great. That is so great. Well, again, we started out, I said, I didn't want to make it about yoga teaching, but you worked in so many really just awesome examples. So I really appreciate that because I think it's just going to resonate with so many of the listeners. Um, so can you let people know how to find you if they are interested in finding out more about you, maybe even reaching out to you to find out more about how to connect with you for, for, uh, one-on-one -on -one work or anything along those lines. Yeah, of course. Uh, the website is uh, drkcoaching.com. So drkcoaching.com. Um, and then on Instagram, I'm still learning how to Instagram. So y'all have to be patient with me. Uh, but it's all day dr period k, all day Dr. K. Uh, okay. And so I uh, look forward to engaging folks. If you know they found something helpful or have questions, uh, come find me and ask and uh, Karen, I really appreciate the opportunity. This was a blast. Of course. And, you know, I'll actually, we, we should have a second, like part two, you know, maybe where we can actually go through some examples of, you know, one of the things I wanted to get on to today that we didn't have time for is some actual examples of people that you've worked with and some actual scenarios. And maybe in future episodes, I could even get some feedback from teachers of things they're really experiencing. And I could kind of be proxy for them and share share those scenarios and you could share some thoughts about that. So that would be fun also. Look, uh, this is my idea of a really fun hour. So uh, I'd be happy to come back and, and, and dig in a little bit further. So awesome. 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 Well, thank you so, so much. I will send you an email when this is all posted and I'll encourage people to comment because even from the comments, we can use that as fodder for future episodes as well. Amazing. 
All right. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you so much for listening to Conversations for Yoga Teachers. I am your host, Karen Fabian, and I just want to remind you, if you would like to get on the wait list for my two premier programs, the Blueprint Learning Program and my mentorship program, all you need to do is visit my website, barebonesyoga.com, and the links to get on the wait list for both of these programs are right on the homepage. Thanks for listening and see you on the next episode.